All right, today we are talking about tulip poplar, Liriodendron tulipifera. Um, now that name, common name, tulip poplar, um, is a little bit confusing. Some of the other common names you may hear are tulip tree uh, or yellow poplar, um, but all of those are confusing and incorrect. Uh, this is, tree is not related to tulips at all. It's a dicot, not a monocot tulips are, um, and it is not a poplar at all. Um, it is actually a magnolia. It's in the magnolia family. Um, so uh, let's start by um, talking about why it's called tulip poplar. Um, it's because of this very distinctive leaf. So this leaf you are not going to see. Let me, I will demonstrate with a smaller leaf. There we go. That's a little bit better. Um, so all of the leaves have this very unique shape um, where they have these lobes. Um, I've heard some people say describe it as like a cat face sort of uh, in you know um, yeah the silhouette I guess of a cat face um, or yeah the tulip um, but you'll have this kind of flat or slightly sort of V-shaped top and these two lobes on the side can't mistake it there's not another leaf that I know of in the whole world um, that looks like this so there we go tulip poplar um, however there's all sorts of other ways to you know identify this tree um, and it is such a common tree an important tree that's important to know those other traits so um, the other thing that really just jumps right out at me um, is the bark and you know I'm a big bark guy I think all bark kind of jumps out at me not all but many um, so tulip poplar has a uh, very distinctive bark it has these uh, vertical ridges and furrows this one is pretty big this one's kind of getting on the way you know to maturity um, these trees can live quite a long time. I believe the max is 450 years or so. Um, so they get really, really, really big um, and they can get massive. I mean, they, they will commonly top 100 feet um, and I think the largest is, is close to 200 feet um, and they can get, you know, four or six feet in diameter. Um, and so they, they're quite large trees, but they will develop these ridges and furrows. Um, a lot of species that develop ridges and furrows, the ridges will be a lighter color than the furrows, um, but tulip poplar is kind of the opposite. And it is a little hard to see on this individual, you know, there's a lot of variation um, in individuals just like uh, with anything, but kind of the toe of that furrow, um, or I guess the toe of the ridge, I don't know, the inside of that uh, furrow is a lighter color. It's a whiter color and it, that's more distinctive when the trees are a little bit younger than this. As the tree ages, that starts to kind of become harder to see, period. So that's probably why we're having a hard time seeing it here. But beyond the bark itself, the form of the tree is very, very diagnostic. They are, they have the best posture, you could say, um, of, uh, you know, of any of our hardwood trees, really. They grow very, very tall, very straight, and they self prune um, uh, very well. So oftentimes you can look up, and this one has a couple low branches, but oftentimes there won't be any branches for, you know, 50 feet or so up in the air. Um, now we're gonna talk about it later, of course, but that factor alone is part of the reason why it has a very, very high value for us for timber. Um, uh, but so the bark, the form are really distinctive. The leaves are very distinctive. Um, like I said, is a magnolia. It's in the magnolia family. They have very distinctive flowers that are in a cup shape that are yellow and orange. They're super pretty and there's kind of like a greenish tint to them as well. Um, we are a little bit beyond um, the time when the flowers are, are being held, but um, you will probably see, uh, taking a hike in eastern forests, these petals littered all over the place in kind of early June. Um, and these are the flowers, the petals of the tulip poplar. Um, and so then they develop, I found some more uh, souvenirs. I had a feeling we were gonna have a hard time finding things on the forest floor here. Um, because of the seasonality. So right now those flowers that have been fertilized, they will look a little bit like this. Um, so the fruit type are Samaras uh, that are held in an aggregate. Um, so every one of those um, uh, fertilized flowers, well, it's going to be a little bit hard to pull apart. So well, th this is what you'll see this time of year, you know, um, early summer. Um, and then um, as it matures, kind of later in the summer, um, and into the autumn, you will have these. And so this is actually a closed aggregate of follicles, or sorry, of um, Samaras as their fruit type, an aggregate of Samaras. When we break these apart, you can see each individual Samara. So this is another thing that you will probably see littering the floor of an eastern hardwood forest um, in the kind of early autumn. Um, so very distinctive Samara. They have that leathery or papery wing, like all Samaras. Um, the seed is down here, but they have that J-shaped hook. Um, 
to them, that little hook, and that is where they attach, you know, to this aggregate of Samaras. Um, and so um, we can kind of break this apart. You can see there's a ton of seeds in each one of these. Um, interestingly, I've read um, that they're only about 10% or so um, viable, th th these seeds. They will, not all of these could, you know, turn into a tulip poplar, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure if that is a predator swamping um, technique where they're, you know, they don't have to put as much energy uh, into things, or maybe it's just the form of holding that, um, that aggregate, you know, so it's good to just be in that form, even if only 10% are viable. I'm not sure, um, uh, but pretty interesting. So yeah, you'll probably see those all over the place. And then uh, in the trees, those will open up a little bit um, and the Samaras will start to blow out in the wind. It is a wind, uh, spread species primarily. Um, birds will eat these seeds, but mostly squirrels, rodents, things, mammals will eat the seeds, um, and it's mostly wind, um, wind dispersion. Um, I guess while we're on the note of the seeds, um, they will actually stay viable in the seed bank for several years, um, which is not super, super common for a lot of tree species. Um, so there's a massive amount of them um, on the forest floor um, every year, and they can persist for quite a while. Um, and so they are that's part of why they're so prolific. They're kind of everywhere. They grow really, really well in open areas. They're not tolerant of shade really very much at all. Um, and so areas that open up, they will colonize very quickly um, and they will grow very, very fast. So they're quick growers, another reason why they're such a good timber species. Um, I guess uh, we can move on from identification now into um, uses, natural history, that sort of thing. So, so yeah, not tolerant of shade. They grow very, very fast. Um, on the commercial value, um, they're, it's kind of a softer hardwood, um, but it's really, really valuable because of that fast growth and because of the form. Um, you can get a lot of, you know, timber out of here um, uh, with not a very long rotation. Um, but so they are largely used for, for pulpwood, plywood, that kind of thing, because it's not super, super high quality wood, uh, but a lot of volume. Um, but uh, as far as wildlife uses, yeah, a lot of things will eat the seeds. Those flowers are a really important source of nectar for pollinators. Um, they bloom kind of, I guess I would say sort of early May, early to mid-May here in, in Pennsylvania anyway, um, which is a pretty important time for our, our bees and our other you know, native pollinators to be foraging um, when a lot of our herbaceous cover hasn't started to, um, to bloom yet. Um, and uh, so yeah, really important for insects, really important for wildlife. Um, this tree will stump sprout pretty vigorously, so when the tree, you know, ultimately dies, you might have sprouting from the roots, um, and if we are coming in and, you know, harvesting timber, you will likely get root sprouts from the tree as well, so um, pretty valuable for that reason. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's mostly common on sort of music sites. Um, in really good soil, it'll grow very, very fast, and oftentimes in stands where it's the dominant tree. Um, where we are now, it is the dominant tree. It is the canopy tree um, in this area, which is kind of, yeah, mesic soils, you know, not too wet, not too dry, somewhere in between, but it has a pretty good degree of tolerance. Um, won't handle very, very wet soils, but you will find it sometimes on stream banks that have, you know, decent uh, soil drainage. Um, but uh, yeah, and then I guess uh, I, let me point out a couple more things on the smaller tree. We're lucky to have a little sapling right here. Um, so back to identification really quickly. Um, a couple things. So first of all, we have these pretty unique stipules um, that form around the terminal bud. So you, we could see these little stipules. So that is modified leaf tissue there. Um, and that will leave scars. So if we look at the stems, you can see scars that encircle the entire stem. Um, and those are scars from that stipule. Um, so that's pretty distinctive. So again, you know, this is just such an easy tree to identify, um, you know, kind of any time of the year. The final thing I want to show, if I can find a good example, is the terminal bud. It is very distinctive to me. It looks very much like a magnolia bud. Um, it's valvate, um, and it kind of looks like a duck bill. It's sort of flat and elongated and of course, I'm not going to really be able to find. Yeah, here's a tiny one. <laughs> uh, they usually are about, you know, three times longer than this. But it's that very flat, uh, duckbill-shaped um, uh, terminal bud is very, very distinctive. Um, uh, oh, and also, yeah, we have more, more, more 
tricks and tips here. Um, the, uh, the smaller trees, the saplings, have pretty distinctive bark too. So we could see here uh, the kind of greenish color um, of the young saplings uh, and those, those striations, those furrows and ridges are starting to form already. Not in this little tiny guy, so. There you have it, tulip poplar, really wonderful hardwood tree. Um, it is found with a bunch of other hardwood trees um, when it's not in these kind of pure stands. Really excellent member um, of our forests, and they'll last in those stands for many hundreds of years, even though they're not very, you know, tolerant of shade. So their strategy is to bolt upright, get up, get that crown up, gather all the light, and then reproduce like crazy, hoping that there will be other openings in the forest sometime soon. And when there are, it is very likely if you have a mature tulip poplar around that it'll fill in with tulip poplar.